Um, the first thing to say about this recent organizing that's go gone on in, in American labor is that it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, inspiration derived from recent struggles like the massive illegal and often highly successful strikes of education workers in 2018 marked by worker initiative, high levels of solidarity and creativity and strong community links. The pandemic initially put a damper on struggle, but eventually employer lack of concern for people's health itself fed into a sense by workers that they needed to fight to get these basic needs met. Those issues people may know were a main driver of the resistance at Amazon fulfillment centers, as well as among healthcare workers, grocery workers, and others. Another result of the pandemic was a labor shortage. I think people are generally familiar with this, and perhaps the so-called great resignation that occurred when workers felt that the health risks of going to work weren't worth the low pay that they received, and when parents found they needed to stay home with their children as schools went virtual. This gave those workers remaining on a job the sense that they had some leverage and led to a series of an industrial and healthcare strikes last fall, the fall of 2021. Some of these strikes continued after workers rejected tentative settlements negotiated by their union leaderships, and they involved high levels of solidarity among different categories of workers. These experiences taught un unorganized workers, first, the value of unions as a fighting tool, something ha that has been largely absent from people's consciousness in the U.S. for a long time. And second, that successful struggle has to be led from below via workers organizing themselves, not simply by relying on union officials. Add to all of this the long decline in working class living standards and the fact that young educated folks entering the labor market since the Great Recession of 2008-2009 found themselves having to work well below their education levels and the background to this potential upsurge becomes clear. Which brings us to Amazon. People may know that the successful efforts by the new Amazon labor union were not the only attempts to organize this behemoth. Workers at a facility in Bessemer, Alabama had reached out to local representatives of the relatively small retail, wholesale, and department store union, RWDSU, fed up with the inhuman pace, constant surveillance, and lack of concern for worker health and safety that Amazon's model of the labor process demanded. People may know that the ensuing effort to win a representation election there in Alabama failed. <clears throat> Despite the obvious necessity of attempting to organize this giant of the logistics industry, neither any of the larger unions nor the AFL-CIO, the major U.S. union federation, were interested in providing the resources and energy to take on the task, far safer for them to continue taking dues from their existing memberships and continue the long-established habit of lobbying politicians for legislative goals. It's not surprising then that workers under intense pressure to relieve the stress of current conditions and earn a living wage might try an end run around existing unions. The Amazon labor union and at the now famous JFK 8 facility in New York is not the only such attempt. A group called Amazonians United led by leftists working at facilities in New York, Chicago, and elsewhere, has for several years organized using a model that can be called acting like a union without yet attempting to achieve official recognition. The group achieves small victories around shop floor disputes by confronting managers, sometimes with petitions signed by many co-workers, with the ultimate goal of unionizing the facility by demonstrating the power of collective action. Most observers and activists agree that it will take a variety of strategies and attempts like these, and like the more traditional efforts implied by the de declaration last summer by the Teamsters Union of their intention to organize Amazon in order to succeed in organizing Amazon nationally. People are probably familiar with the story of Chris Smalls, 
who led a walkout at JFK 8 over the lack of protection against COVID-19 at work and was fired. He and a few close associates, Amazon, uh, sorry, primarily people of color like himself, put together a group who began calling themselves the Amazon Labor Union and collecting signatures for an election under the rules of the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB. You may not be aware that as the drive proceeded, some young socialists got hired at the facility, or if they worked there already, joined the ALU. The ALU's worker-to-worker -worker methods proved to be what enabled their success against the powerful anti-union tactics Amazon used against them. They spoke to co-workers every day, often provided free food outside the facility, intentionally built relationships between ALU members of particular ethnic groups with co-workers of that ethnic group. And they spoke against management representatives at what have been called captive audience meetings that Amazon required workers to attend to hear anti-union propaganda. Part of that employer message, the warning that a union would be a third party who would simply take workers' dues, made no sense to people who could see that this supposed third party was the same people they worked alongside every day. One part of ALU's organizing methods was, however, entirely traditional, the decision to campaign to win an NLRB election in order to get union recognition rather than beginning by building towards a recognition strike. NLRB procedures are notoriously slow and tedious. After a successful election, there are many objections that an, an employer may file, often causing months and even years to pass before the union can bargain and then win a first contract. The ALU organizers were aware of this, they are aware of this, but also used the NLRB to their own advantage <clears throat> by filing unfair labor practice charges against Amazon's tactics successfully and are counting on the relationships and solidarity they built to continue organizing on the job while the legal proceedings drag on. What remains to be seen is whether shop floor worker activity overcomes not just Amazon's delaying tactics, but the attrition problem stemming from the sky-high rate of worker turnover intentionally created by Amazon's churn and burn labor process model. As well, Amazon has shown that it is willing to break the law with such tactics as firing organizers and lying to workers about union-related matters, knowing that the consequences will not be much more than a slap on the wrist. Nonetheless, ALU's success and the group's extensive positive press coverage has inspired workers at scores of other Amazon facilities to contact them for help. Starbucks, we have seen, is an equally ruthless union buster, also relying on illegal firings, lies told during captive audience meetings, and one-on-one -on -one meetings used to isolate and intimidate workers considering unionizing. Militant workers are, of course, aware of the similar spot they are in to Amazon workers and many others. But the organizing effort that began in Buffalo, New York, was originally only conceived as a local one and not an attempt to begin the process of unionizing the entire company. Workers there wanted to emulate their colleagues at a local coffee chain who had successfully unionized into Workers United, WU, a small affiliate of the Service Employees International Union, oriented towards organizing less organized sectors like restaurants. They also prepared for NLRB elections, and as they did so, were met with intimidation from the supposedly progressive company, which is so determined to resist unionization that it flew in management representatives to this relatively small city to convince workers not to vote for a union. Like the ALU, the Starbucks Workers United campaigns in Buffalo and later elsewhere have been worker-led. WU staff organizers understand and encourage the worker-to-worker -worker organizing that has scored the recent successes across the U.S. It has turned out that the one-store-at-a-time model 
has been to the worker's advantage since a high level of personal bonds and solidarity develops at these locations. In many cases, as workers identify with others who are also LG, LGBTQ plus or people of color. After two successes in Buffalo, Starbucks workers elsewhere been, began to emulate them. Retaliation, including some high profile firings, though intimidating to some, has worked overall to encourage workers elsewhere to the point where now workers at close to 200 Starbucks stores nationally have won recognition elections. In some cases, workers have organized successful strikes against the retaliation and intimidation. Starbucks Workers United, as it is now called, is now a nationwide organizing effort with the goal of organizing the entire company into a single union. As in the case of Amazon, what remains is to outlast management's delaying tactics, including illegal ones, secure recognition, and fight for and win an adequate first contract. To do this, the workers will, of course, need to learn new skills and build an even deeper connections with coworkers and community support against the resistance of a deep pocketed and determined corporate enemy. As with the ALU, Starbucks workers who win an election know that as they say, this is only the beginning. In the meantime, these successes have already inspired others elsewhere. High profile union organizing victories have occurred at newspapers and magazines, conspicuous retail locations, individual locations of major grocery chains, higher education institutions, the first organized Apple store in the US and others. The publication Labor Notes, which orients primarily to rank and file worker militants, has served to track all of these, giving them often excellent and useful coverage and even to bring people together Labor Notes also functions as a training center and host of a biennial conference, the 2022 edition of which proved to be the largest and most exciting in its 40 plus year history. Where is this movement headed? How likely is it to continue to spread? Will it achieve the real improvements in workers' lives that it needs in order to build confidence, combativity, and a collective sense of solidarity in the working class as a whole? Will it change the character of a union movement still dominated by a distant conservative bureaucracy? These are of, there are, of course, no definite answers to these questions, but I think we can lay out some considerations in this regard. First, of course, there's the question of how to take down giants like Amazon and Starbucks and win important contractual victories. In the interest of time, I'll leave any further consideration of that to the discussion period if people want to get into it. But how quickly victories can be achieved is of some importance. A collective understanding of the current political and economic conjuncture is needed in order to sustain the movement. Favorable labor market conditions are not likely to last as we enter what may be a worldwide recession. Some have begun to refer to a closing window of opportunity, raising the question of how groups of worker organizers can keep the movement alive, even if its progress is for a time severely slowed. They will have to develop an understanding of what is possible now and find ways to make links with other workers and social movement activists, particularly in a climate of right wing resurgence. Worker organizers will need to link up with workers in organized industries, working to democratize their own unions and better understand and avoid the so-called business union tendency that even progressives and well-meaning leaders fall into. In other words, they will need to continue to build activist, independent bases of power among workers themselves, even in a period of downturn. The steps needed to develop a working class politics and the organizational forms it can, that can sustain it can be begun now. It has historically been groups of socialists that have brought such political ideas to working class movements. And in the United States, the dominant socialist group is the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. DSA members have in fact been involved in some of the recent organizing efforts and DSA has a close relationship with Labor Notes. 
Units of DSA focusing on labor have recently forged some important connections. The Emergency Workers Organizing Committee, EWOC, is a joint project of DSA and the United Electrical Workers, a small radical union unaffiliated with the AFL-CIO. EWOC seeks to organize workplaces in areas such as retail and restaurants. DSA's National Democratic Socialist Labor Commission, the DSL's DSLC, created in 19 to 2019 to provide centralized resources and direction to DSA's labor work, has so far failed in the eyes of many to do so, but now has a new steering committee pledging to do more. We'll see. DSA units have engaged in strike support and community support for organizing drives, for example, through an organized campaign connecting to Starbucks workers. But DSA's work has been inconsistent and too focused on workplace organizing methodology. DSA workplace activists adopt and spread the excellent organizing techniques promoted by labor notes, including the possibility of vying for union leadership in some cases. But rarely is there a sense that socialists have or should have more to offer than organizing skills. When politics is raised, it is almost always in the form of electoral or legislative campaigns. The organization is highly decentralized and not suited for collective discussion. The practice of local chapters varies widely. In some cases, workers have been grateful to get an important boost as DSA members came out in support of an organizing drive or strike. Without minimizing the importance of such support or the experience it gives, to DSA participants, there's generally not much more that DSA provides in such cases than bodies for a picket line. In other cases, DSA has failed to help even in this way. ALU activists contacted the labor branch of the New York City chapter and were ignored until after they proved themselves with their victory. Further, DSA's movement work is siloed and bureaucratically structured. Activists in the movement against police violence are in one so-called working group, environmental activists in another, LGBTQ plus activists in a third, and so on. There are no clear channels for these groups to communicate with one another and discuss how their struggles may strategically be linked. I don't want to draw strictly negative conclusions, though. The organizing drives continue with important successes, and socialists, including those in DSA, gain experience and look to deepen their understanding. Starbucks workers talk about possibly striking all of the organized stores simultaneously. And the ALU hints at engaging in an organizing strike at JFK 8 if the NLRB process drags out too long. What all of this means for further organization, either within the socialist movement or in the broader working class, remains to be seen. Thanks. I thought I'd just start with the short introduction that might, uh, you know, kind of clarify some of my perspectives. So um, I think it says in the program, I'm here in my personal capacity today, it's true, but I'm also a staff organizer for UAWD, um, Unite All Workers for Democracy, which is a reform caucus, a rank and file reform caucus in the United Auto Workers. Um, and I'm a former UAW member myself um, from my involvement in the Harvard Graduate Students Union. So that's part of the organizing and higher education um, that Mel mentioned. I'm also active in DSA in the Boston chapter. I'm on my second stint now as co-chair of the Labor Working Group in Boston DSA. So I have a lot of thoughts on both union reform and what socialists can do to, to support it. So Mel and I thought, you know, it makes sense for him to go first and talk more about new organizing and for me to go second and talk more about, you know, the internal organizing that's going on in existing unions, which is very related. So there is indeed a resurgence of militancy within existing unions, including uh, industrial unions that I think many people may have written off, like the Teamsters and, and the UAW. So, uh, you know, what's, so I'll, I'll talk about, I'm planning to talk about kind of what's at stake here, um, uh, well, how did it arise, what's at stake here, and, and how do we sustain it, and how can socialists um, uh, support this? Um, 
So this is, you know, to me, a really key piece of how we can reverse the decline uh, in the organized labor movement in the U.S. Um, I'm going to be talking primarily about coordinated national reform movements in the Teamsters, the UAW, and then a little bit about the News Guild as well, which is not an industrial union, but which is also experiencing a resurgence. Um, but there are other examples like the teachers unions. Um, but uh, to my mind, I think, uh, you know, the Teamsters and the UAW are probably the primary examples of nationally coordinated reform movements in these very large unions. Um, so there's a really important relationship between internal organizing and new organizing that I think isn't always apparent to people. Um, so the Teamsters um, elected new uh, leadership that's much more planning to take a much more aggressive approach to the companies. And um, we'll have to see how it bears out. But uh, that means uh, they're planning to take on uh, UPS, United Parcel Service, in contract negotiations in 2023, and they see that as very complementary to um, organizing new workers at Amazon. Um, in the UAW, we're also hoping to elect new leadership this year, um, and our primary focus is on negotiating contracts with three uh, U.S. domestic automakers for General Motors and Stellantis, which used to be Chrysler. Um, but we also believe that will really help us organize um, not foreign owned plants in the US, which have been very resistant to organizing and which, uh, you know, is uh, I think half of all auto manufacturing is still non-union and also the merging electric vehicle industry, which is a big threat um, to uh, many workers in traditional um, internal combustion engine uh, uh, vehicle manufacturing. Um, and then we see actually the direct consequence of electing new leadership in the news guild. It's led to an aggressive wave of new organizing and uh, contract campaigns uh, in uh, you know newsrooms across uh, the U.S. So, um, so the first question: Where is this coming from? So, uh, I do believe union reform caucuses have played a very, very important role in both instigating and sustaining a lot of this organizing and pushing leadership in, in a more militant direction. So um, some of you may know there is a very longstanding caucus in the Teamsters called Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Uh, it was founded, uh, I'll, I'll say more about TDU a little later, but they, uh, it was founded in the 70s. Um, they have sustained themselves over many decades. And uh, recently they allied with breakaway leaders from the incumbent um, and, and one leadership. Um, UAWD is a newer caucus, but we have uh, many very uh, important influential members of our caucus who were involved with previous reform movements in the UAW. Um, and uh, we have many newly engaged younger members as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we've each engaged um, in uh, some common tactics and uh, been pushing for common reforms. So I think the most important of these um, is the establishment or use of direct elections of top leadership. So that kind of paved the way for m different election victories in the Teamsters. Uh, it's definitely finally opened up the doors to competitive elections in the UAW. Um, I can talk more about what those elections are going to look like this year. Um, and uh, it's also, I believe it also played an important role in uh, the new leader, uh, the election of uh, the new leader in uh, leadership in the News Guild. Um, so relatively few unions in the United States have direct elections, but actually I can tell interest is growing from uh, the Labor Notes Conference that Mel mentioned, we had a panel on establishing one member, one vote, and a lot of people express interest from other unions and how they could organize uh, for it in, in their own union. Um, so, uh, you know, but I, I think, you know, there's also just a lot of um, activity that's more spontaneous um, that's arising without any sort of much organization or coordination or coordination. So just within the UAW, there were uh, actually two major strikes last year um, that resulted in multiple contract rejections, um, uh, rejections of contracts that the leadership of the union negotiated. So um, I think many people know about the John Deere strike. It 
they um, rejected two contracts by 90%. Uh, there was a lot of UAWD actually made many connections with John Deere workers during that time through our strike support efforts. Um, and there was just a lot of solidarity on the picket lines. They were on strike for a month. But from what I can tell, it was a very bottom up organized uh, sort of uh, rebellion. Uh, you know, it, you know, we didn't get in touch with them until later. Um, and, you know, it was even unclear to me um, how much organization they had among themselves outside of the, the Facebook groups, you know, that all these workers are, are in. Um, uh, a lesser known strike that also happened last year in the UAW is happened at a Volvo manufacturing plant in Virginia. Um, they also voted down their contract multiple times. Unfortunately, um, the company was, uh, you know, more successful in, in breaking uh, that strike. Um, but, you know, these are um, some, and then now at uh, another agricultural implements manufacturer, um, Case New Holland, there are a thousand workers on strike who are very inspired by the deer strike. So, so this was definitely a time of rising um, worker militancy across the board. Um, but, you know, I, I think this energy can definitely dissipate unless it's captured into, not captured, but, you know, uh, incorporated into some sort of ongoing organization. Um, and we have been able to get um, several deer workers involved with UAWD. Um, and then uh, another really important, uh, uh, you know, institution or multiple institutions that I think have helped sustain this, definitely labor notes. Um, we've gotten advice and support from them at UAWD. There's a strong connection between labor notes and Teamsters for Democratic Union. I know they're also supportive of the new leadership at the News Guild. Um, and I, I also think DSA has played a very, very important role in um, helping to sustain a lot of this organizing. Many TDU and UAWD members are also members of DSA. And I know I've also found it an important source of uh, just advice and, and support as well. Um, so, uh, so I'll go talk a little bit more about um, each of uh, what happened in each of these unions. So, um, so the Teamsters, as most of you know, um, is one of the largest unions in the US, uh, 1.2 million members. Uh, many members work in logistics and a quarter work for UPS, which is uh, the world's largest courier company by revenue. Um, so TDU started in 1976, the year after Jimmy Hoffa disappeared. It was started by socialists um, in IS, international uh, socialists, and uh, had a small staff to this day. Um, so it was founded in response to corruption and, you know, the pro-company uh, approach of the leadership. And start, they started agitating for um, the establishment of direct elections through, uh, you know, national uh, bottom-up petition drive. Um, and then uh, the federal government um, stepped in uh, after a lawsuit and established a, a monitorship. Um, and through that monitorship, they introduced direct elections. And in the first year in 1991, that direct elections was introduced, um, the TDU endorsed candidate Ron Carey uh, one election. So the very first year they had direct elections, they were able to elect uh, a reformer. And Ron Carey helped lead the 1997 strike at UPS, which is still, I think, one of the biggest strikes the U.S. has experienced in the last 25 years. Um, it was widely seen as successful. Um, unfortunately, um, after that, uh, Jimmy Hoffa's uh, son, Jimmy Hoffa Jr. Uh, took over the union for the next uh, leadership of the union for the next 20 years and reverted to a much more uh, business unionist sort of approach. Um, and then, but TDU went on, I think that's very important. TDU went on building its activist uh, network and winning uh, control of local union leadership um, across the country. In 2016, the TDU back candidate, Fred Zuckerman almost won. Uh, he got 48.5% of the vote so the Hoffa administration saw the writing on the, on the wall. Hoffa declined to run again in 2021. Um, so last year, the uh, uh, TDU endorsed Teamsters United Coalition slate with Fred Zuckerman and Sean O'Brien uh, at the top of the ticket, won by a two to one margin. Um, so this was a coalition between uh, 
you know, sort of core TDU leaders, as well as breakaways from the Hoffa administration, some of whom, like Sean O'Brien, had historically been very hostile to TDU. So this was a very sort of interesting coalition, um, but, uh, you know, it really paid off in terms of the uh, election victory. Um, so Sean O'Brien campaigned on a vow to really um, uh, take a much more militant approach with UPS, uh, prepared to strike UPS in 2023. There are 300,000 workers under the national contracts who certainly the biggest strike the U.S. has seen since the 1997 UPS strike, um, and they vow to take on um, Amazon. Uh, so, uh, you know, we we'll have to see how this all plays out um, in the next, in the coming years. Um, so, uh, so then um, the next union I was going to talk about is the United Auto Workers. So we're a somewhat smaller union, but we still represent 400,000 active workers and 600,000 retirees. Um, so the UAW was one of the most important, is still one of the most important unions in the U.S., but it's in, been in very bad decline since the 70s, since the days of Walter Ruther. Um, uh, it's notorious now for many failed organizing attempts, uh, terrible contract concessions that resulted in two tier contracts um, in the big three automakers and uh, employers like John Deere, um, and just increasingly terrible leadership, very cozy with management. Um, so uh, some of you know, this culminated in a major corruption scandal, uh, which erupted in around 2018, and ultimately led to 15 union officials being sentenced to prison including two former presidents of the UAW. So this was a really wide ranging corruption scandal with different arms of it, uh, it involved embezzlement, bribery, kickbacks, um, really everything. Uh, and, you know, I think many people saw that this was a sort of um, kind of the tip of the iceberg, you know, so, uh, not all corruption is illegal as one of our UAW uh, likes to say. Um, so the UAW uh, has been controlled by the Authoritarian Administration Caucus, founded by Walter Ruther um, for the last 70 years. Um, so there definitely are opponents uh, in this upcoming election. And uh, UAWD was founded in 2020 um, to, and they focus on organizing a response to the corruption uh, and to the lack of democracy uh, in the union. Uh, we have a somewhat similar model to TDU. We have a very tiny staff right now. Um, and several founding members, as uh, I mentioned, were involved with previous reform efforts like the New Directions Movement in the 1980s, which was the last time a dissident was elected to the International Executive Board of the UAW. Um, we're anchored in manufacturing, um, but we have a lot of support and active participation from the higher education sector and other sectors of the union since it's diversified. Um, they're active socialists uh, in, in all the sectors of, uh, that are involved with UAWD. Um, so similar to TDU, we pushed for direct elections uh, from the bottom up. Um, and also similar to the Teamsters, um, a government monitorship was established in the UAW as a response to the corruption. Um, and instead of just giving us one member, one vote, they decided that we needed to hold a referendum on it. Um, so all of last year, we were focused on winning this referendum to establish direct elections, um, and we did win it. Um, and, you know, at the time, we were, you know, a little put off that we weren't just given direct elections, but it was actually quite important for our caucus. It helped us build up a national activist network, um, and we established a reputation as, you know, the forces pushing for democracy in the union. We gained a lot of campaigning experience. Um, so now later this year, um, we're going to be holding the first ever national leadership elections by direct vote. Um, we're putting up a reform, a slate of reform candidates. And in 2023, uh, the big three automaker um, contracts go up for negotiations. So that's 150,000 workers. Um, but there's also talk of, you know, uh, striking to get rid of tiers and contracts and um, other concessions. Um, I think I'm running a, a little bit over now, or will soon, but I'll just mention briefly, um, the News Guild is the third union I wanted to talk about. They're a much smaller union, obviously not an industrial union, but they represent, um, I think, 
50% or more now of uh, unionized journalists and other types of media workers in the US, they're around 26,000 members. Um, in 2019, uh, a reform leader, John Schluss, was elected. He was a journalist who was involved in the organizing drive at the LA Times, which is a historically very anti-union uh, newspaper. Um, so the News Guild already had direct elections. I'm not sure when they were established. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, John Schluss won the election uh, out of 2,300 votes cast. Um, so since then, they've been on a really terrific organizing spree. Um, over the past four years, they've organized at least 7,000 new workers. Um, so now they represent 2,000 workers all together at the New York Times. Um, so that added, uh, you know, their union grew from 19,000 to 26,000 workers during that time. Uh, they represent 400 bargaining units. Um, and so as a result, they're now negotiating an insane number of new contracts. Um, they've gone on many strikes, uh, issued many strike threats. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine who is now an organizer at the News Guild. He said it was the busiest organizing job he'd ever had. Um, so I do think it seems clear that new leadership has played an important role in, in um, ramping up this activity. And you know, news media uh, unionization is, is important for, for a lot of reasons that I'm sure um, would, would be apparent to, to everyone. Um, so I'll just wrap up by um, naming what I think are a few of the tasks of socialists in supporting this uh, revival militancy within unions. I think first is just educating people. Um, a lot of, you know, uh, I, I think a lot of people don't really take an interest in internal union politics or they find it opaque. Um, so we just need more educational events like this one, I think, and more media coverage. Even the Teamsters election, which is so consequential, wasn't covered as much as I thought it would be. Um, it was difficult to get news outlets to cover our referendum vote, but we did do a big push to, to get media coverage of it. Um, you know, so usually there's kind of two sides, pro-company or pro-worker. And I think that's kind of the main thing um, that, that uh, needs to be, be clear um, in, in media coverage of, of these elections. Um, so uh, in terms of what, you know, I think DSA's role should be, so Mel mentioned uh, many of these things. Um, so the new leadership of our National Labor Commission um, are uh, dedicated to um, different aspects of the rank and file strategy, um, and uh, which focuses on rebuilding the activist layer uh, in existing unions. Uh, so key tactics, tactic is encouraging socialists to take jobs um, in uh, workplaces to agitate and organize, unionize workplaces. So I've seen this bear fruit in the Teamsters, um, in the UAW itself. Uh, many of our retiree activists um, took jobs in auto plants, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and now they're still organizing with us. Um, and DSA is also supporting uh, SALTs in or unorganized workplaces as well, like Amazon and Starbucks. Um, if you're already in a union, you know, um, I would uh, definitely encourage activists to, suggest, to begin uh, building a union reform caucus or network. Um, definitely, I think it's important to not just engage in shop floor organizing, but also uh, contest for leadership positions. Um, I, I do think that's very, very important in most unions um, and agitate around contract demands and prepare coworkers to go on strike. So I think this is very challenging work, especially when you're coordinating in a large union with many locals. Um, it does help if there's a national contract uh, that, uh, you know, workers feel there's something at stake for them in reforming, uh, you know, the, the larger affiliate. For instance, uh, it's easier to organize uh, workers in the Teamsters who are UPS workers and also um, workers at UAW who, um, are in the big three since their contracts are so clearly tied to leadership. Um, uh, I think uh, DSA uh, should continue uh, uh, engaging in strike support um, and materially show up for workers as well who are not on strike. Uh, one thing that we also do is connect workers who are in the same industry to each other. Um, uh, uh, contribute to uh, uh, strike support fundraisers. 
Um, and then you can also, without, uh, you can directly support union reform caucuses. You can donate. Um, usually, uh, a TDE and UAWD both accept donations from, uh, you know, non-members um, and connect caucuses with each other. Um, definitely support institutions like labor notes. Um, so, you know, I, I do think I've seen socialists play a very important role in the development of both um, TDU and, and UAWD um, and many other uh, union reform movements. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we definitely uh, need to um, step up this activity, not, uh, you know, uh, disengage or anything. So, um, so yeah, sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs>